Craig, I fucking love this movie. Miller's Crossing, 1990. The Coen Brothers' third feature film is absolutely excellent. And I ran a poll on my Twitter asking all of my, my lovely viewers and followers, hey, we're going to cover the Coen Brothers tomorrow, finally, because, you know, because they're amazing. Which film should we cover? Miller's Crossing or No Country for Old Men? And you unanimously upvoted No Country for Old Men, like 20, 20 votes in like an hour. And we're not doing that. We're not doing that. Thank you for participating, though. It means a lot to have your voice, but I'm doing the opposite of what you said. I was just, you know, throw, you know, what would you do, you know? I don't know. That was... You got pranked. That's what happened. I gave you the high hat. I gave you the high hat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I actually think... Well, the reason we didn't do No Country is because the way we do these analysis videos is that we watch them together. And I've seen um, the three go-to Coen Brothers films like ten times each. I've watched Fargo, Big Lebowski, and No Country for Old Men an insane amount of times. And I just couldn't do it. But it had been a while since I'd seen Miller's Crossing. And I think Miller's Crossing should be uh, mentioned in the same breath as those other three. I think it's really really good and i think it's really different for the coens too i actually think it's their most sincere movie as well because they're trying to do some very interesting I, things i thought it was fantastic the only thing i didn't really care for was the score yeah that oboe okay the score was amazing during scenes of um like intensity or like kind of like looming doom where um where Gabriel Byrne brings John Turturro's character in the woods, and then also when uh, Mr. Hi-Hat himself is uh, killing uh, the Dane. Like, the, the the score goes weird, like, like kind of eerie, like, like almost like a horror score, but for the mm -hmm. most part, it's like an oboe, like, kind of in the background at, like, an Irish pub that you'd be at these days, and it, it was a bit... Offsetting, mm, yeah. A bit offsetting. I know that it was probably to... Uh, because our main character is part of like the Irish mob, I know that that must have been what it was for. And also, it goes with the the color schemes of the whole film. There's green like everywhere. There's at least a splash of green somewhere. If Heat was a film about blue, Miller's Crossing is a film about green. And I guess that the uh, typical Irish music it didn't kill the movie at all for me. It's just um. Just isn't the best score I've ever heard <laughs> in a Coen's Brothers it, it movie, fine, for sure. I, I didn't really care for it. No, nah, I mean, maybe if uh, I came from a background that was in any way Irish, that would resonate with me, but I come from a Jewish background, which I actually loved that the two characters, like the two most misfit and awful characters in this whole movie were the Jewish ones, um, played by Marsha Gay Harden and John Turturro, uh, Bernie and Verna. I... I, I that's just an aside, but I just love that, that they were the ones in this melting pot that was just fucking causing so much conflict and commotion. But I do love the film opens up. This is a very like classicist style movie. And in, in the sense that a, a lot of these, a lot of the framing techniques and a lot of the performances, I'd say basically all of the performances are coming from, uh, a good kind of contrivedness like that they are they are artificial but it's like a classicist take on it because it opens with like the godfather opening shot in reverse where the godfather uh, starts um starts close in and like moves out and uh like on on this person pleading to the don to uh pu punish someone who's been hurting his daughter and and this one it's the opposite it's it's the inverse of it it's someone pleading to the, to uh, Albert Finney's character that the boss and it's pushing in on his face. So like immediately the Coen brothers are showing us that they are using classicist techniques and even tropes, but they're inversing it all. It's not necessarily a deconstruction rather than a modernization. I would actually say, I would say this was an incredibly modern feeling film that was very much like an old gangster film. You know oh, I mean? dude, yes. Um, there were so many moments in this movie that just, like, really just paid off for 
that exact feel. Yeah. Like, if you wanted to watch a movie about some classic gangsters, then you, you definitely get your fill at a couple points in the movie. Um, especially when, uh, what, what was his name? The main leader of the, uh... Tom. Tom Reagan. No, Almost no, not the, Tom. Um, the leader. Oh, Leo. Leo, yeah. When Leo puts the cigar back in his mouth after shooting everyone up, that was very satisfying. Absolutely. And speaking of the Godfather, Tom Reagan is a play on the Irish character in that film who acts as the consigliere, uh, Tom Hagen, played by Robert Duvall. So it is like they are being very self-conscious or self-aware, or at least letting you know that they are aware. What did you think of Albert Finney and the way he played Leo? What did you think of that character? I thought the character was um, fine. I, I liked him more when he was being a badass than when he was just uh, being, I guess, himself. Um, I love that he was essentially being cuckolded, but he was never emasculated. He was always an incredibly machismo figure. Yeah. I'd have to say my favorite character was uh, um, Casper, you know, John Polito's <laughs> character. He was very, very funny, very spot on. Um, just the way he, like, his facial expressions were amazing. Uh, I don't know, like, he, he fit the role he was trying to fit very well. I thought he did that. Um, so. Yeah, John Polito was excellent in it. My, my favorite character I've always really liked. I remember when I first saw this movie, like, very, very long time ago, I thought that uh, our lead, our lead character, Tom Reagan, was just really cool really interesting i liked the idea of the a film being told from the point of view of the great manipulator of the guy who's whispering in everybody's ear um i thought tom reagan was excellent just a man who saw every single angle and i think that's really philosophically interesting too and we're gonna get into that and i mean let's just get into that right now because when the film opens up uh john polito as johnny casper is giving a monologue and i think it's about the themes that the film is trying to express or interpret in an interesting way. Um, friendship, character, and ethics. To which Albert Finney responds clear as mud, which I think completely really does um, define the ethics and the morality and the friendships in this film. It's very murky, uh, especially since our point of view is uh, some sort of gangster Rasputin whispering in everybody's ear. So let's get into some of those philosophies a little bit. Okay. And so, Craig, what did you think of Bernie as a symbol? Bernie was played by John Turturro wonderfully. This is probably his best performance because it's really, it's a really hateful performance. You really don't like him because he's so manipulative, but not in a way that's attractive like Tom Reagan's, but in a way that's kind of just cruel and... Um, like, very incredibly selfish. But what you think of him as, as a symbol, as the... If, if the film is trying to express something about ethics or morality, was it moral for Tom Reagan to spare him in the woods? Because that's, like, kind of... That's the centerpiece scene. That's probably the most important scene in the movie, is where John Churchuro, Bernie, Birnbaum is just groveling and praying and, like like, weeping to, to be spared, and Tom lets him go. Uh, do you think that that was a moral decision to make? Uh, I don't think he made that decision morally. I think he made that decision because he was in love with Verna. I mean, that, that entered into his morals. So then what did you think of the end, where he had to kill him, essentially? Um, I'm actually a little confused by the end, because I, I thought I was starting to understand its motives, but then at, by the end, it's almost as if he didn't really have any motives. Yeah, because Bernie says, like, what's your angle then? You ain't got no angle. <laughs> why, yeah. why you gotta kill me then? And I think that the reason is that the ethics and the morality of the film are very murky. I mean, he spared him, and then Bernie decided to use him. Yep. Despicably use him. Almost to the point that you're like, the one good thing Tom did in the film, he shouldn't have done. <laughs> he should have killed Bernie in the woods. I'd, I'd, um, he did it out of, I think, 
his morality, his ethics, because I do think he enjoyed Bernie just as like a weird kind of caricature because he liked, um, he was entertained by him, at least in his house. Like, oh, you're interesting, Bernie. He did want to get rid of Bernie, but he didn't want to do it himself. And I think that getting, it's the, it's the whole thing about like, like ethics, ethics, friendship, values, um, and character. What does it say? What, what do you think of Tom Reagan as a character? Do you think he's an antagonist or do you think we were told this from a heroic perspective? Um, hmm. Because everyone who dies in this movie is because of him. Yeah, I, I felt like he was just kind of uh, looking out for himself, more or less, and the only thing that was holding him back was the. Uh, Vernon Vern, Leo. Uh, like, basically, the woman. Um, uh. I feel like he was basically trying to detach himself from everything, but he couldn't. Yeah. And then maybe that's what the whole end of the movie was supposed to be, was that he did. He did. Well, he was insulted by his own surprising morality, and he had to, had to revenge it. Bernie was just so ungrateful. Had to put a bullet in his head. And also, at that point, he had already lost Verna. Because Verna pulled a gun on him, like, two scenes before... Or a scene right before, actually. That's actually really interesting to think about. It's almost like the movie was about watching a man lose everything, and then when given the opportunity to have it back, just refuse it. Refuses, forsakes it on purpose. What's your angle? What's your angle. We'll, we'll go back to that. We'll, we'll, we'll end with more talk about, about Bernie, Tom, and Verna, because I think that that's really interesting. I think it's like, philosophically penetrating and really mysterious, because I think that that is the main focal point of friendship, character, and ethics. Whether or not Tom made the correct decision to be moral in that circumstance, and also whether or not he was justified to be cruel in, in the film's climax. But let's move on. What did you think of how the how it was uh, filmed? Like, how did you think? Of, and um, maybe just this more technical aspects. What did you think of the the dialogue, the colors, um, the cinematography? Cinematography was spot on. This is probably my favorite cinematography in a Coen Brothers movie by uh, Barry Sonnenfeld. I believe it's the last film he um, uh, photographed for them. Barry Sonnenfeld, excellent photography for this film. This has excellent photography. And the editing is very good, too. It's pretty amazing. Um, like a staccato-style editing during the more intense sequences. It's really nice. And the rest is, is classicist framing. Like, it really is a well-put-together film. This might be a little bit more my fault than anything, but sometimes I felt like the dialogue was easy to uh, lose track of what they're actually talking about. I think um, that's also kind of the point of the script, too. Because when Tom Reagan's talking to somebody outside of Verna, and even on occasion with Verna, Tom's never being sincere with anyone he's talking to. So it's almost like you lose track of what's going on because in any given scene, Tom Reagan is is doing these acrobatic displays of keeping up 10 different facades and like keeping people following 12 different false leads, you know? And like when he's smiling, he's really grimacing, (laughs) that kind of thing. Uh, really great script writing, a lot, lot of awesome lines. I mean, we got off, the, like, <laughs> just a lot of awesome lines. What'd you think of, uh, like, the green hues? Like, did you, did you like the, the color in it? Um, I liked it, but it didn't really, like, stand out to me as symbolic, I guess. Um, because I can't, I can't even begin to believe or, uh, assume what they were trying to get at with the colors but uh yeah I, I felt like the colors just added to the movie and just mm-hmm. made it more appealing than anything else uh, yeah i think it's a, like a multi-textual kind of kind of film ex- experience the colors i uh, don't um don't just uh, signify that the film is uh kind of irish at heart but also the fact that if we were talking about green envy um green greed you know green money like, there's always some driving force in this scene, and the driving force is usually very selfish. 
for every character involved. Every character is trying to trick a different character into doing something for their benefit. And what about something that was symbolic, um, opening up on what we later learn is Tom Reagan's dream of his hat, uh, kind of like um, a tumbleweed, just being blown down Miller's Crossing itself. I think that Miller's Crossing, where Bernie is buried and spared uh, simultaneously, and where um, Tom Reagan seems to have these dreams of, of losing his hat, and there's uh, so much, so many different things with hats. Hats are symbolic, and I think that Miller's Crossing itself as like the geometry of, of, of symbolism, I think that the actual physical place Miller's Crossing where they go is like pretty, pretty symbolic, because it's all, if that's where... Tom Regan go, meets a crossroads in himself and can either get out of this easy and get rid of Bernie or, or do something a bit more um, risky, which is something that's actually moral and ethical and almost the, the right thing to do, which proves later on to be the absolute worst thing he could have done. But Miller's Crossing, uh, I almost feel like it's like an esoteric kind of place. Like, it's weird. And I love the way he filmed it. The dead leaves all on the dirty ground everywhere. And the hats? Did you get anything from from either of those? Um, the only thing that I would have to I would have to look again to see if I'm right on this, but it, it, pretty sure everyone was wearing basically the same hat. And they did different variations on hats, but really, okay. yeah. Well, yeah. then, um, I don't know because the very last scene, you know, he uh, he adjusts his hat and then does the whole thing, you know, when he was introduced in the movie where he kind of like slowly lifts his head and just barely shows his eyes. What was your favorite scene in the movie? Favorite scene. Yeah. Hmm. And before we get off it, um, hats like in, in poetry and in literature and normally in like in paintings and art, they do symbolize authority or power. So we can see as every time a man loses his hat, he loses his power, which is actually what brings Tom Reagan to Verna's bed in the first place because he lost his, his manhood there and had to go retrieve it. And what's great is uh, he said there's uh, nothing more silly than a man chasing after his hat. Exactly. So if we just replace hat as a phallic symbol or as a symbol of authority, this, this movie is insane. <laughs> like, it just reaches up above uh, into, like really like poetic landscapes there uh no uh, as far as my favorite scene goes i would have to go back to uh when those men tried to come and uh take a hit on uh leo yeah that is a really badass scene and it's really cool because the coens are always they always are in touch with the humor and the bravado of every scene like they're always in tune with like the cinematic Ness of every scene that they're doing, even when they're striving for something that is real, a uh, more realist take, they imbibe the scene with style. Yeah, and uh, I think adding humor to the scene actually kind of like brings out uh, a bit of realism in it as well. Because, like, I'm thinking of the scene where um, the big dude comes. And he, you know, he takes off his hat and his coat and he goes to hit Tommy and Tommy hits him in the face with a chair. And he's just like, God damn, Tommy. And then he just walks out of the room. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's just hilarious. Like, it, it proves that, you know, they didn't have beef. It was just business. And when t Tommy hit him in the face, he's just like, God, man. <laughs> that was hilarious. There were so many funny parts. My favorite scene, I mean, I would probably have to say that centerpiece scene we talked about of uh, sparing Bernie in the woods or uh, at Miller's Crossing, or my favorite scene is when Bernie returns at, at his apartment and he's like, you thought I was gone. I'm not so funny anymore, am I? Like, it's really weird. The dynamic has shifted and um, there's some great lines in it. Like um, when Bernie leaves, uh, if Casper ain't, uh, if Casper ain't a stiff in a couple of days, I start eating restaurants and um, I love because we see that's Tom Reagan being desperate, you know, like jumping out the wind, like trying to beat him out the front door so he could kill him and like falls and stuff. And like we actually like Bernie because it's such a humiliating scene because this is the guy who you like you're you've saved his life basically. And not even because you like him, but because you like his sister. 
And this guy is just being so awful to you and standing over you, like making you like eat shit. <laughs> I yeah. think it's great, but um, I also love the scene where he's on the phone with Bernie, and he's just like the deals off, and he won't let him talk. It's yeah, pretty great because then he he gets his that's his power play. He gets it back. Bernie is wearing a hat in that scene. <laughs> he is. He's. I think he's hatless for the for the rest of the time. But I think he's wearing the hat when he leaves the house because he's in the oh, authority. Oh, yeah, he puts, he puts the hat on. When yeah, he... and then obviously when Gabriel Burns running out the door, he didn't put his hat back on. So yeah. one is in authority and one is ineffectual. So there is a symbolic like language going on in this film, but it's not pretentious at all. It's just makes sense. It's just uh, that's good. And it's also great to point out that any time one of the characters would sit down and take off their hat, they... Um, they don't. They don't actually take it off. Yes. They just take it off their head. They put it somewhere else. They put it on their knee. They put it on their shoe. It's it's right there within reach. Incredibly stylized. I even now I'm thinking of that final scene where Tom Reagan, um, Verna is marrying Leo and has completely dismissed herself of Tom. She's drop dead. Were her last words to Tom, and and then Tom disbands from from Leo for good. After all the work he went through for for the two of them, he was. I think of the way he put on his hat and the way the camera like moves in, like in a lyrical kind of. Um, well, it's great. A heroic way, really, and he like looks up, like he's really truly wearing. He's like he has authority over his own being now, or something. Like he doesn't have a master. Well, he puts on the hat, and then Leo puts on his hat, and then he adjusts his hat. Well, when Leo actually starts the the heart to heart where he's trying to forgive him, he's he's wearing a kippa or a yarmulke, and he takes it off mm -hmm. so he could be more vulnerable to speak to Gabriel Byrne to, to Tommy. Yeah. Oh, there's so many. Oh man, that hat, that hat. I'm sorry, this is too high high highbrow high hat for y'all, but we're giving you the high hat. <laughs> giving you the high hat right now. Yeah, we even talked about a drinking game you could do with this movie. You can definitely do a drinking game. Every time Tom gets punched or every time um, Casper says the high hat. High hat's a double shot. Yeah. <laughs> and he says it a lot. But You're I think Coen's were wise enough thing. not to make him say the hi hat thing, where he is like just beating oh, yes. Eddie Dane to death. I was expecting him to go this time. I give you the hi hat. I like that it wouldn't have been low. no, but it wouldn't <laughs> have been outside the realm of possibility though. Yeah. Like for that character, that's what you would expect from like a from, pretty from any lesser filmmaker, most definitely. Yeah, so good. How do you... okay. 1990 is, is Miller's Crossing, and, and during the 90s, the output of the Coens was incredible. Um, yeah, I mean, you had Fargo, and you had The Big Lebowski, and also in the 90s, you had these other amazing American filmmakers popping up. I mean, this was before Reservoir Dogs. This was before Pulp Fiction. You also had like Wes Anderson popping up with his comedies, Paul Thomas Anderson popping up with Boogie Nights. Um, Steven Soderbergh, Spike Jones, uh, Sofia Coppola, you had this huge American renaissance of independent filmmaking. Or This isn't even an independent movie, but they started off in the indie sphere. You had this amazing decade of really new, like an American new wave is what it has to be called. It has to be called the American new wave because we made so many great movies within the span of 10 years. How do you think the Coen's fair like today? Um, do you, I, I see their influence a lot, especially the way that they would mix humor, especially in something like Fargo or, or in the more intense scenes in Miller's Crossing. I see the Cohen stamp or the presence of the Coens in a lot of different things. Like, I don't think a lot of our movies would be the same if it weren't for Fargo and aspects of Miller's Crossing or uh, Big Lebowski. Uh, what, do you, what do you think of the Coens as filmmakers? Um... They definitely stand out, that's for sure. Like, I, I don't feel I could ever watch one of their movies and not know that it was made by mm -hmm. them. And, like, obviously, you know who made a movie. But it would just stand out. Um, it's, I don't have a whole lot of deep things to say because I haven't really thought about this subject. But, yeah, they... It, 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 I, I could see them being very influential in the way that uh, 
not in the same way, but in the way that uh, Kubrick has been very influential to people. That that's very high. Um, that's very well. I'm saying that's like too high. <laughs> well, I'm saying I'm I'm saying, and the fact that you know when you watch a Kubrick movie, it's a Kubrick movie, and when exactly. you see someone who's taken influence by Kubrick, you know it. When you watch a Cohen movie, you know it's a Cohen movie. Absolutely. If you see influence, you know it's influenced by Cohen. I'm not saying that the Coens are online with Kubrick. I'm saying in in the same spirit of influence, you could it would be obvious. Oh, absolutely. Auteur theory works in spades here. I mean, that's, you know, just brought up Tarantino. There's no possible way you can watch any one of his movies and not know who made it. The Coens have the same very strong character. Yeah. And I actually think the Coens are better than Tarantino. I don't think they're as important or as significant to world cinema as Tarantino was because he reinvented the wheel with Pulp Fiction. But the Coens, like that, I think that is like the heart of like Americana art in the 90s and 2000s. I think that they were the quintessential, them and Sofia Coppola were the quintessential American filmmakers. Yeah, and they're... uh Definitely fulfilling something that I've wanted for a while, and it's uh, I, I wanted to see what a romanticized version of America would be, and yeah. I think that movie does that's it actually very perfect. Well. That's what I was saying earlier in so many <laughs> convoluted words. Like I was talking about, like the classicist framing of it, like the, how it's kind of contrived, like it's kind of artificial. The acting and the performances and the set pieces. That's what it is. It's a romanticized version of America. And you, I think you could transfer that over to many of their other movies, but it's not anywhere near as effective as it was in Miller's Crossing. Yeah. Because this is really, oh God, it's just so good. And it feels like a classic movie. And I wish more people had actually seen it. And now that I think about it, yeah, all, all their movies are pretty romanticized versions yeah. of America. Because when you watch Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, it's like, that's that's one of the most southern movies you could possibly Heavily. watch. Um, and then you watch uh, Fargo, and you, you look at the cop, you look at the the nice little family, and the guy who's just a yeah, car dealership. It, it, it is, it is a bit romantic. It, it is, and it's a bit sentimental, it, it's too, very, but, in a, but in a way that is... It's like romanticizing... Sub- substantiative. Like, it's, it's still substantial. It, it, it's fantastic, because... Um, it's almost like they, they can romanticize what's inherently non-romantic. It, like, they romanticized uh, suburban life. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the Fargo. Big Lebowski, they, they romanticized bowling alleys. Like, they take the, the normal parts of American the American fabric and they make it very interesting and the part yeah. of the American fabric that Miller's Crossing is romanticizing is not necessarily historicity or like a historical narrative it's our ideal idealized forms of history and like we think about history from the perspective of popular culture we think about gangster movies and film noir movies and that's what they're romanticizing but they're telling you it through with, with modern speech and a modern tongue and like modern techniques and it's really just and, fascinating and it's almost like they're uh they're showing a comfortable side with it because they're not unwilling to be comedic about it oh no not at all i mean uh, life is absurd <laughs> too if they're striving for any amount of realism that that's totally fine and and, and like i said they're self-aware they're aware that this that people say rumpus twenty times. They're aware that yeah. like, people say hi hat twenty times. <laughs> that the violence is extremely overdone in this film. Like we mentioned, the scene with Albert Finney, uh, Leo going crazy on the, on the intruders with a machine gun. He shoots that dude with a machine gun for thirty seconds. Not exaggerating. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, that was that I mean, was really weird. Sam Raimi's uh, nice little cameo as like. It's like the trigger happy cop outside. He he also like shoots like crazy, like two gunning it and yeah. that stuff. It and then is he gets, <laughs> And then they pull out the giant gun. Yeah. There was a lot of things that honestly looked like they were almost out of a parody. But yes. it, it's it's But it was sincere. It's it so shot in such a way where it's like it's not parody. It's Yeah. Uh, the, the, the camera was so good in this. So good in it's super dynamic camera, depth of field choreography, and the way that it would, like, uh, it was a super responsive camera. I, I really yeah. definitely, definitely liked it. And you mentioned um, Fargo, and, and you implied uh, Frances McDormand uh, married to a Cohen, and she even appeared in this for a second. Yeah. It was, it's always nice seeing Frances McDormand. Um, but, like, 
their ability to like going back to the parody thing, uh, they're they have a really good ability to almost show you how absurd something is without um basically without zooming in on it they yeah. they just present it to you and it's like you yourself are telling yourself that it's absurd as opposed to the movie exactly outright telling the only you scene that, i can remember yeah the only sequence i can remember an aggressive dolly in was uh the scene where casper is killing uh Dane. and since that like aggressive like um kind of invasive camera technique is only used in that one scene, which is, like, also a pretty eye-opening scene of uh, why Johnny Casper is even a mob boss in the first place, because he seems so ineffectual, and in that one scene he just loses his fucking shit and kills the most sinister figure in the entire film with a shovel. Uh, like I said, like, the camera is really expressive and responsive, and it doesn't force these ideas down your throat. That's the only time where it does, but that's because it's, it's responding to, like, the revelation that, that Johnny Casper is a bad motherfucker. It was kind of great because it was like, uh, it, it, it almost felt like it should have been off, but it wasn't off because it was just adding to the tension and how awkward the whole situation was. Because the, the camera felt tense, but also awkward. And then exactly. the scene itself was tense and awkward. Well, because it was trying to... Uh, th they talk so much about angles, about Tom Reagan finding his angle and knowing every angle in a situation. Tom Reagan was having to regroup in that scene because everything fell apart for Tom there. He and did then not he plan for that. And like the camera was was like Dutch angle, so it was off kilter, it was off center, and because Tom did not have an angle in that scene, he could not frame it correctly. Yeah, it was, it was chaotic, and then it ended up falling in place for him, because that could have been the end. Absolutely could have been the end, and oh, like, this movie is actually getting more incredible the more we talk about it right now. That's why I like having these talks, is because... You, you watch a movie, and you're like, that was fantastic. And then you have a talk, and then it's like, oh, I could write a book about this movie now. <laughs> well, I hope our viewers feel the same way. Uh, I'm going to do that hyperbolic thing that I do in every video and say, this is my favorite Coen's Brothers movie. Coen's Brothers. I hate that. Coen Brothers. Coen's? Coen Brothers. Coen Brothers. Uh, I guess I'm going to do that thing where I get tongue-tied on every video, too. Okay. Well, I mean thing is, with the Coens, like, this is my favorite movie of theirs until I'm watching No Country or Fargo, and then that's the best movie of theirs. They just are so good at it. Um, Craig, what did you think of the setting that it was in? It, it, it wasn't, like, a specified date, but it was, like, a date in time or a date in really film history you like, know what it that really, we all know without having to be told exactly what it is. What it felt like was going to... A comic book store and picking up an indie comic about like uh mobsters kind of did uh, but it was better at doing that than road to perdition was than actual stuff that is based on like <laughs> you know gangsters like sin city was just come on this is awesome no no i'm saying like uh the reason i said indie comics um in particular i guess i meant like uh a little subgenre where they're not taking themselves a hundred percent serious. Yeah, hundred percent serious. serious. Okay, I can that, get that's that. That's one with of like, my favorite genres too. Is when when it's serious, but it's not serious, but it is serious. I can almost get that with tone, but not really with like atmosphere. Because like a comic book, and even an, or especially an indie comic book these days, seem to imply that it's the opposite of what we said. That it would be loud. That it would be like the framing would be incredibly. Um, well, I mean, Overexpressive well, or overcomposed, and this oh, is I not. I guess that's fair, but like there was a couple settings that were like a little over the top. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, like, I the, get the, you the with completely the empty warehouse with really, really nice furniture in it. Uh, you what you, was you talking about that? the warehouse where he was uh, tortured, or no, not tortured? He was supposed to be tortured. Yeah, yeah. but I, <laughs> that was yeah. That it's also the most colorful scene too because it's green everywhere, and his and his wife's just there, like rambling at him yeah and also the mayor's office is like over opulent <laughs> you know like yeah. with the huge painting in the background so yeah. i don't know maybe i would rather just call it um like like you said earlier like a parody more than more than like a comic book uh almost like um 
like there are scenes in here that should have been used for a comedy movie as opposed to a serious gangster film, but yeah. it never feels uh, contradictory. It never feels like an oxymoron because everything works. Because the tone, the tone is not like uh, the tone is the same character as Tom. No, I think. that's that's what's great. It's because like when you watch the when you watch the scene where you go into the mayor's office and it's just over the top. Yeah. Um, including like the twins on the couch. Yeah. Like. The, the, the way you feel about it is almost the way you would feel about it as if you actually went to a mayor's office and everything was over the top and then you go and talk to someone about it afterwards. You're like, oh, I went to the mayor's office and everything was just Exactly. Um, and I, I, I just think that the character or overall tone of the film is, is one of like cleverness, like wit. I yeah, think it's almost, that like it's, to, it's like Tom Reagan's personality and manifest. Like it's just clever. It's just everything's like kind of it, cartoonish. It's like almost like a parody over a cup of coffee, as opposed to yeah. a parody with a big red nose. <laughs> but parodies don't normally make me question my ethics or character, her moral fiber. Like it's really cool that it that it was able to. Ju- juggle these scenes and it has to do with that score though that we talked shit about earlier because when it changes because there's absolutely nothing funny or even for for john churchuro's like yelping and screaming and like drooling it's not over the top for someone to be doing that when they're begging for their lives so it's really uh fascinating the way that the cohen's capture this film because and the scene where the character is doing the most expressions and being the loudest he possibly can, it's incredibly real and like kind of like um, hard, not hard to watch, but um, it's it's gripping. It's a it's a gripping part of the film. John Turturro's character was really interesting because he brought a weird kind of dynamic to it. So that was very good. Uh, did you think that any actor in particular like impressed you? Oh, you liked uh, John oh, Polito. Yeah, John Polito. Yeah, he was awesome. Really impressed me. No, uh, obviously the main character play, played by That's the role, best I've seen him. He, he, he was fantastic. Um, Marsha Gay Harden I want to give a shout out to because this is a, not a normative kind of role for her. The, the Coens always cast interesting women as their leads, like Frances McDormand and Fargo. Always interesting women who probably would not have been cast in this role in, by any other director. And she... It's also my favorite Marsha Gay Harden performance. She did pretty wonderful. Also, the guy playing the Dane did a really oh, good job Jay of being Freeman. Mm, he was so good. I like it. Oh man, when he invades her her room and he like finally becomes this like sinister villain of the film. The way he like, oh, how, how, how do I know you're not gonna kill me when I tell you? Because then I wouldn't get to kill you again when I found out that you were lying to me. And then he tells him, he's like, you know what? I actually believe you. And then shoots him in the, like, it's, oh, man, the Coens, man, the Coens can write better than Tarantino sometimes. I'll give them that. It's really fucking crazy. What, 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 uh, what's going to be your takeaway from the movie? <laughs> to watch another Coen movie. Yeah. <laughs> We're definitely going to do more. I'm probably going to also look into some more uh, noir, because... With this and The Godfather, I, I just feel like this is definitely a genre. The, the noir that, that this film makes me want to watch more than any other, it's like Carol Reed's The Third Man by, in uh, 1949, um, starring Joseph Cotton and uh, Orson Welles in a ph- phenomenal performance as Harry Lyme, who's like this sinister, manipulative figure like behind the screens, but like a really nice, charismatic guy. It's almost like Miller's Crossing is told from the perspective of Harry Lyme. You know what's fantastic <laughs> is, uh, I, I know we don't bring up anime a whole lot on this channel, but it's actually relevant this time. I watched an anime called, uh, I believe it was called 21 Days, and I feel like whoever wrote the story behind that anime must have loved this movie <laughs> because there, there's so much similarity between the two. It, well, in in some ways, um, that's got a completely like you you completely understand the main character's intentions and what his motives. Right. As where with uh, Tom, you, you kind of lose track of why he's doing what he's doing. Exactly, and so does he. And then when he realizes that Verna is kind of using him as well for her brother's life, that that's the only thing 
that that's why she's even involved in this kind of relationship with him because she knows that it keeps her brother alive. And he realizes he's just being used as part of an angle as well. Then everything gets, as Leo said, uh, clear as mud. Gosh. And uh, I wish this Coen Brothers movie, um, I was being like, you know, I was joking around earlier with that, with that poll. Not with the results. You guys completely unanimously fucking gave Miller's Crossing the hi-hat on that. Uh, <laughs> Um, but I was like, I do, I do take what you guys say uh, seriously. But at the same time, I wish Miller's Crossing was more talked about because there's a lot of different themes that you can talk about from the film. You can talk about its composition and the concepts that it expresses. It's really, really good. I wish it were uh, considered in the same category as uh, as No Country for Old Men because I think it has that kind of power. I wish it. I, if there's an underrated Coen Brothers movie, it's this one because it's phenomenal. And more people should see it. Any closing thoughts, Greg? Um, no. No, no, no. <laughs> I actually don't have any closing thoughts. I, I think we've said just about it. You've given me the hi hat. You've given me the hi hat. I'm giving you the hi hat. All right, guys. <laughs> <laughs> like, comment, subscribe, and share. This is Zachary Conan saying Miller's Crossing's amazing. Thank you for watching. <laughs>